Good morning, church. Good morning. Let us stand and worship to our great God today. He brought us here safely, and as the weather starts to turn and actually feel a little bit wintry, we can still give thanks to our God for all that he has given us. So sing with us. Good morning, everyone. I'm Pastor Evan. Delighted that you're with us in worship this morning. You're at First Covenant Church, and we are disciples who make disciples. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord together? Amen. All right. I agree with you. Uh, here, if you're a guest with us, welcome this morning. We're glad that you're here. There are some notebooks in the back. We uh, encourage you to pick those up. They're not just for guests. Anybody can have them, but guests particularly, grab one. People have really enjoyed using those as they take notes and prayer requests and all kinds of things. Uh, and even take them out and about in the community. Uh, people see uh, where we're from, and maybe that sparks conversation. So we're delighted that you can have that. A couple things about the life of the church today. First of all, there is Sunday school after for all ages except high school, which I'm saying that to nobody almost uh, because I know I've got one behind me, so I'm not saying it to nobody. Uh, but almost all the high schoolers are at retreat this weekend, um, and so pray for them as they come back uh, a little bit later today. Um, and they're having a delightful time, from all I can tell. Uh, there are two giving options besides our normal offering that we'll take this morning. Um, if you're on the e-news, which I encourage you to sign up for, uh, you would have seen that this week. Uh, we have, they're both represented on the altar here. The cans, the Covenant World Relief and Development cans, which we collect every year, are up here. You're welcome. If you brought yours, bring it up here you know, during the offering or at the end of the service and just put it up there. You can even put it on the stage. Um, at the end, whatever. Um, and you can bring it next week too. That's fine. Just put it on the altar when you bring it so we can bless those and pray for those as they go. Also, you can see the shoe box there. Operation Christmas Child. We collected 200 or packed 298 total boxes last week. Thank you. And so we like to help ship them. It costs some money to ship them out. So uh, if you want to collect, there's some open boxes around. There'll be some kids in the back even collecting for that. You're welcome. 
uh, to and invited to contribute to that. This box will eventually go out there too and you can put directly in that box. Amazing, huh? Uh, two other things in the life of the church then. Um, Advent decorating will happen a week from Saturday, uh, the 2nd of December, starting at 9 in the morning. And there is pizza for those who show up to that. Um, and so we would love if we could have your help on that. Um, it's not just that we put stuff up. It's a fun communal event, too, to be together and do that each year. So you're really encouraged to put that on your calendar. The other thing that's coming up is on December 10th. Uh, we have the cook. I don't think I'm going to get it right, Garrett. It's the epic choir concert, Cookies and Cider. Okay. I got it right. Um, that will take place on Sunday, December 10th. Um, and so we encourage you to make sure that's on your calendar as well. That's going to be right here in this room um, and then out in the, uh, the cafe there. I encourage you to be here for that. Um, and certainly after worship, join us out there today uh, for coffee and snacks and everything else. Uh, as, we be, as we continue in worship and as we sing songs about kind of moving close in proximity to God, you'll notice that theme. Um, I want to just put this question before you. What do you need today that only God can provide? Have you thought about that this morning? What do you need today that only God can provide? There are a lot of things that only God can provide, but what do you need this morning that only God can provide? And may I encourage you to use that as a focus as we continue in worship and worship our good God to recognize what it is that he's given us and how many ways he's blessed us, the things that only he could provide. So let's stand together and let's continue in worship today.
trust in you. Our scripture reading is from Psalm 62. For the director of music for Jeduthun, a psalm of David. Truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. Truly he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. How long will you assault me? Would all of you throw me down, this leaning wall, this tottering fence? Surely they intend to topple me from my lofty place. They take delight in lies. With their mouths they bless, but in their hearts they curse. Yes, my soul find rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Surely the lowborn are but a breath. The highborn are but a lie. If weighed on a balance, they are nothing. Together they are only a breath. Do not trust in extortion or put vain hope in stolen goods. Though your riches increase, do not set your heart on them. One thing God has spoken, two things I have heard. Power belongs to you, God, and with you, Lord, is unfailing love. And you reward everyone according to what they have done.
Father, we come before you because we want to draw nearer to you. And it's only because of your work and your invitation to us that we can come before your throne because we know we are not worthy on our own. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son who spilt his blood to become the holy and perfect Lamb, the sacrifice that makes it possible for us to see your face. Lord, we give you all the glory and honor and praise. We thank you for your love for us and everything you've given us. And we know that only you give good gifts and they come from you. Father, may you receive our offering today, both in song and in prayer and in the gifts we give. May they be a sweet sound to your ears. Lord, help us to encourage one another in our walks to draw closer to you. May you be everything for us. In your holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. And at this time, we'd like to invite our ushers down to collect the offering.
have this one because, you know, sometimes the pitcher's voice is more fun than mine. So I have to do, have you heard any talking too? So you guys come on over this way. Watch me just raise it. Come over here. You got to be able to see, you have to be able to see this, and you have to be able to see Crosby, and you have to be able to see Mickey. There's just so many choices today, right? Okay, so. He may have made a choice and changed the details. I don't want to change that. Because what do we know about the Bible? We know it's true, and we know it's relevant. And who's it relevant to? All of us, right? And so sometimes the things that are in the Bible are not all that fun because it puts us to think these other things, right? So we have tons of choices that we have to make in our day. Have you guys had to make any choices already today? Have you? What do you have? choices that you made? Like not to drink this. Oh, that's a big one. What other choices have you guys had to make? Whether to put your down, pick, pick your pick down things or pull your face. Yeah, that's a choice. Okay, whatever. What other choices have you guys have to make, had to make today? Or ever? Do you do your parents sometimes have to make choices for you? Yes? Do you like it when your parents make choices? Okay, put your hoodie down. Put your hoodie down. Put your shirt down. You can come over here. You can sit back here. Okay, so I lost my train of thought. Okay, so your parents make choices for you, right? Do you like all the choices that they make for you? Do you like all the choices that they make for you? And you know what that means? That means of water, will it ever be the same again? No. So I'm going to transform this water. Okay, so watch. Watch it be transformed. Everybody, eyes over here. Over here. Okay, ready? I'm going to transform this water. Ooh, I can see where this is going. Okay, so now, is that water? There is water. It is sugary water. a good thing. Do you want to see what a transformed heart looks like? Yeah? Okay. I'm going to try and see if Crosby will show you what a transformed heart looks like. Come on, everybody. Come. Okay. Come over here. Come over here. Crosby's going to have his hands over there. Come on. Keep moving. Keep moving. Keep moving. Go faster. 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 I know you can move faster. I've seen it. Okay. So I'm going to show you a transformed
Who's going to hear other voices from here? You are not the only one. Sometimes your parents, and sometimes your parents have to get in the way, right? And they have to redirect you. They start talking. Say. And those voices are going to keep happening. And the more we practice, the more we practice watching and doing what God wants us to do, the more transformed we will be. Doesn't it feel good to see Crosby obeying and making the right choice? You know, God tells us to do things, and sometimes the answer is going to be, no, I don't want you to do that. And sometimes it's going to be, well, maybe we can do it later. Or sometimes maybe God is going to say, that's a good choice. You can go ahead and do that. Crosby, go. happen right away, but you know what? The more we let God help us, the more we're going to know what he wants for us. And his plans are way better than ours. Watch your hands. Hey, I really pray for you guys that your hearts are free to serve him. You know, you can be everything that God wants for you to be. Do you want that? You know what? That's not your parents' decision. That's your decision. Do you want a transformed heart? And I just pray that you do. Let's pray, and then you can go on back. And, and come on back up here after church. You can come down here. Dear Jesus, we love you and are so thankful that you have everything we need to have a transformed heart. Heart, help us to want this. We love you, Jesus, and we're so thankful for what you do in our lives. Amen. Good morning again, everyone. Sherry, I did not change my mind. We're in Proverbs 16, and we're going to do 1 through 3, so I invite you to find that this morning. But I will tell you that I made a mistake when I was putting together uh, the... Um, can my voice go down just a little bit in the house? Uh, when I was putting this together, uh, which is Garrett was... We were going through worship planning, and Garrett said, Are you sure you wrote down the right verse that you're going to preach on for this week? Because I had written down Proverbs 6, 13, which says, Who winks maliciously with his eyes, signals with his feet, and motions with his fingers. It's obviously partway through a thought, and I wasn't going to preach on that verse. That was not my plan. So we'll go with the plan uh, that we originally wrote down, was intended to write down, Proverbs 16, 1 through 3. Verse 3 is the one that's the most searched for, as we're in just the last two weeks of this Scripture on Repeat series, the most searched for verses. Uh, that people look for for encouragement and hope and those kinds of things. So let's read all three verses. It says, To humans belong the plans of the heart, but from the Lord comes the proper answer of the tongue. All a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. This is the word of the Lord. We have a piece of artwork in our house that's hanging over one of our kids' beds. And it, it quotes part of uh, Psalm 4, 7, which says, You have filled my heart with greater joy. And I've realized that as I sit there and look at that, hanging over one of my, my kids' beds, I have to consciously realize that the you in that passage is not referring down but up. It's not referring down to the person lying in the bed. Because of the placement, sometimes my mind goes there, that my child has filled my heart with greater joy, which they have. But that's not what the you is in the verse. The you is God. God, you've filled my heart with greater joy. And I find that interesting uh, that I have to consciously do that with that particular piece of artwork because of the placement of that particular piece of artwork, which I like very much. Because it's a reminder that it's easy for us humans to make ourself the focus of God's story. In fact, it's really natural for us to make ourselves the focus of God's story, isn't it? That was not me, sorry. Uh, but it was a powerful point, apparently. Um, it, is, it is easy to do that. We naturally do that. And as I look at something like 
uh, Proverbs 16, particularly verse 3, because that's the one that people uh, search for, commit, your, commit to the Lord whatever you do and he will establish your plans. I don't know what they're looking for. I mean, I assume that people are looking for uh, something like hope and encouragement and direction particularly. But if I may, it kind of seems like it's the kind of verse that is designed almost to make a rubber stamp of people's decisions if you read it wrong. If you misunderstand the verse, it feels like it's that kind of verse that people would, would think, I have these ideas in mind, and I, uh, God loves me. God's given me a lot of good things. And so it would seem logical that God's going to probably bless what I want him to do. I mean, can, is, is there some agreement that we could possibly potentially read it like that if we're not reading it correctly? And I don't think that's a correct reading of it. So let me give us some enlightenment on this, because what's interesting is rather than just sticking with verse 3, as I looked at this, Verses 1 through 3 actually go together. That's why I read them. You know, the Proverbs are, are fun in that sometimes you, you wonder why this proverb came after this proverb. You're a little confused. But in this case, they go together quite clearly. And they have what we run into all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, which is called a chiastic structure. Don't worry about the term, but it's an ABA structure in this case. And I want to show it to you because I think it's interesting uh, and enlightening to us. So it doesn't matter if you can read the words because of the color. Oh, you can. Not on my screen, you can't. They're awful back there. That's my fault. But you can see that the first line of the first verse and the last line of the third verse, they kind of coincide, and then second and, and second to last, coincide theme-wise. And the middle becomes sort of a hinge. Uh, in this case, literally, it weighs out what we were thinking in the first verse with what God actually wants in the third verse. And, I, and that structure is built in because it's not just the verses that we're reading. The structure helps us understand what it is that's going on here and what God would have us hear in this passage. And so I kind of want to walk through the three verses together, and I've got a few other passages I'm going to bring in. But we'll start with verse 1. It says right there, To humans belong the plans of the heart, but from the Lord comes the proper answer of the tongue. And as we look at that, I think it's really important in this week of Thanksgiving, that's coming up, to be thankful people. I hope there are some thankful people in the room. We should be thankful. It's a great thing that we have an intentional time to be thankful built in uh, within our country. I like that. And those uh, that are Canadian, you get it twice if you live in this country, so that's even better. Um, but be thankful. It's, it's really a remarkable thing that God has given humans the ability to think. Have you ever thought about that? God gives us the ability to think. Last night, you know, I let my, my dog out right before I went to bed. And uh, she got, after doing the normal dog stuff, she got wind of something that was under the picnic table that flew away. I didn't actually see what it was. I don't know if it was a bat, a bird. I don't know. But she was on the hunt, right, at that point. It flew out. It was out of the yard, I mean, in, in moments. But she was back in the back corner. I had a light on so I could see. And you can see in her mind all the little dog instincts are working at, at each other to try and figure out what's my next move supposed to be. And they're kind of competing with each other. Like, I could go back to the table where it was, but I know that it went over here, and I can smell something. And, I, and you can see that's working. But there's no point at which I'm convinced that she had a master plan or was working out a master plan to think of what's going to happen next, right? We have the ability to think. I can't go to my dog and talk about beauty and talk about if it's subjective or objective. It's not going to go anywhere, right? She doesn't have that ability. We do. We have the ability to think and to abstract and do all these things. It's a remarkable thing that we should be thankful for to God. We have the ability to plan and put together plans. We have the ability to, to actually be creative which I think is one of the remarkable things that God has given us, that we, we bear the image of God in that way, that we're creative, right? We don't all live in homes with just contractor white walls and nothing on them. We're creative. But we also recognize that we should be thankful for that ability to think, but we can also get in trouble when we start to do it. We can start to get in trouble when we think. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. Or the Didache, which is an early uh, kind of writing for the church and how to, how to live together. It says there are two ways, one of life and one of death, and there's a big difference between those, to paraphrase. Going with my dog example, just to think this through a little bit further, uh, I think beagles are, are just absolutely fun dogs. They can get lost in their nose. If left to their own devices, they're, they're gone. 
Again, no master plan. They're just going to sniff their way wherever it goes. Maybe a different way to think about this with uh, the fact that we can get in trouble in the master plan bit. Um, cows. Have you ever driving down the road, you see a whole field of cows. Have you ever thought that a cow made a master plan of I'm going to start at this patch of grass, I'm going to work my way over there, and by dinner I'll be here? No, that never happens. And we know that never happens for a lot of reasons, but especially because when you drive by, they'll have a field full of grass, and they're all sticking their heads through the fence eating anywhere but that field of grass. There's no master plan, as we've talked about. But have you ever also, because we can look at the animal world, as I've done, and say, well, that's just the animal world, but have you ever had anybody give you this advice? Just follow your heart. We hear it all the time, right? Just follow your heart. There are times when that works out. There are a whole lot of times when it doesn't. Jeremiah 17.9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? And when we get to that word heart, the same word heart in Jeremiah 17 is the same word heart in Proverbs 16.1. It refers to the whole self, the decision-making entity that is you. Some translations have mind. I don't think that's quite enough, although that's getting there. It's the mind plus the energy. It's the full everything that you got being employed to do the thing that you've planned. And when we see that word plan there, that term actually refers more to battle plans, like the whole thing laid out and put together, not just what I charted out on a napkin at lunch, but like I've put together this whole grand idea, and I'm going to follow it through with everything that I've got. Like that's what it's talking about. And I don't know if you've had those experiences, I'm sure all of us had, where you've put together a wonderful plan, what you thought was a wonderful plan, and all it takes is one person just pulling a little thread and the whole thing falls apart. I remember when I was uh, early on in ministry, working with college students, I was leading small groups, and I remember I uh, had everything prepared, ready to go, and I sit down in this small group, and it just takes one bad attitude from one person that day. On the first question, I don't know what was going on in her life that day, but she's like, well, this is a stupid question, and that kills the whole thing. Battle plan gone. How do you recover? If we put this then in context with verse 2, we kind of see what, what God wants to do with this. Verse 1, humans belong to plans from the heart. They plan from the heart. Verse 2 says, all a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. What does it mean to have these motives weighed by the Lord and our thoughts and plans weighed by the Lord? Old Testament scholar Bruce Waltke says it poetically when he says, the human, the human being forms, the Lord performs, they devise he verifies. They formulate, he validates. They propose, he disposes. They design what they will say and do, but the Lord decrees what will endure and form part of his eternal purposes. Which I think tells us the qualifications of what would matter here to God in our plans. Is this of eternal value or not? Does it fit with what I have planned or not? A more practical way that I thought about it this week is maybe to put it in the form of a question. And we sometimes do this when we go to God in prayer with our plans. We'll plan and plan and plan and plan. God, please bless them. Move on and we do the plan. So I put it in the form of a question. Do I seek God's baptism of my plans? Or do I desire a transformed heart seeking God's plans? I think that's a more practical way to approach What's, what's, uh, what Waltke said there, which I like very much. Do we just plan and then say, God, you love me, you're going to rubber stamp it? Or do I want something more to go on in my life, in my relationship with the Lord, so I know what he actually wants, and I can plan better? I think that's what's going on here. And I want to take a few biblical examples of where God redirected plans um, in a really positive way, but I think where we can take a, a few cues and see where you find yourself in these. So I'll read a couple different passages we're going to start with Abraham, um, and then we're going to do giant skip to the New Testament, so we're not reading all of the Old Testament, just if you're worried. Genesis 16, 1 through 5, has this moment in Abram and Sarai's life. It says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. 
Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan ten years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, You are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. A lot that we could dissect, and we're going to dissect almost none of it, except to say, if, I think if Sarai just re- read back what she said to her husband, there would be a lot of changes in thought there. But God made a promise to Abram and Sarai. Eventually become Abraham and Sarah. He was 75 when the promise was made. Now it's, we see, about 10 years later. And it took 10 years for them to kind of lose that trust in God that he's going to fulfill. They shouldn't have, but they did. And in their attempt to make their own plan then, they created an Ishmael, a problem in this case. And we could look at them after we hear what Sarai said and Abram went along with it and all that goes on, and we could kind of ask the, the Dr. Phil question, how did that work out for you? You know, it didn't work out. It's a bad move. They didn't weigh their plans out by the Lord and what he wanted. They lost trust and did their own thing. They assumed he would baptize their plans or whatever. And this is a ready temptation for any of us, I think. I think it's a ready temptation for any of us when we so desperately want our plans to work out and then we question, God, are you ever going to act in my life? I think we can take a cue from Abram there and Sarai. Second example comes from Galatians in the life of Paul, the apostle. Galatians 1, 13 and following. Paul's writing to the Galatians, he says, For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me so I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human beings. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia later I returned to Damascus. So he now follows a different path because of God's call. And Paul was doing what he was trained to do when he was going around killing Christians. When he was the Pharisee of Pharisees, he was doing what he was trained to do. It seemed right to him, and his plans were done with his whole heart. All of his energy and his mind was employed in doing These things, but when God spoke and weighed out his thoughts and actions, he responded by shifting to God's plans. Third example that we're going to take here is of Peter. Peter, when Cornelius' folks are coming to visit him because they've been called upon by the Lord, because God's about to fully expand his covenant to the Gentiles in a way he had it had not been done before. In chapter 10 of Acts, starting at verse 9, it says, About noon the following day, as they were on their journey, so it's Cornelius' people, and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. He gets a direct word from the Lord, and I don't know about you, but have you ever had the Holy Spirit nudge you, and you say something like that? Surely not. Surely you're not calling me to redirect my plans that way. Surely you're not calling me from this kind of comfort to that discomfort. Surely you're not calling me to have a conversation with that person or to give to that thing or to help in that way or to serve over here. Surely not, God. You're not calling me to do something else than what I want to do right now, what I'm comfortable doing. Surely not, Lord. Have you ever responded the way Peter does? 
When God called Abraham, he called him to a life of trusting in his faithfulness. When God called Paul, he called him to be more godly, not less. And that meant knowing that Jesus was the next installment of God's plan. And when God called Peter, he was asking him to take the message of God's kingdom to a people who were ready to hear. But it was uncomfortable. It was completely different than he ever expected in his master plan. And I want to point out something. There are voices that will tell us then that this verse is still a rubber stamp verse and God will call us to whatever our hearts desire, but that's not what the verse says. God is going to call us to be closer to his presence and to co- toward a character like his. That's what we see in these stories. That's what God is always calling us to do. If it doesn't do those things, it's not the call of God on us. And then we get to verse 3 then of Proverbs, going back there. This is the most searched for one. And this, I think, after you take it through the, take verse 1, say, I've got these plans, take it through the, the weighing of the Lord of those plans, and then it comes out the other side of the, the machine, if you will. On the other side, it says, then commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. And what's really nice is living out this verse is not dependent on your circumstances. You can do this regardless of your circumstances. Living out this verse is not dependent on your relationships that you have or don't have. Living out this verse is purely dependent on how transformed your heart is to be like Jesus Christ. Living out this verse is purely dependent on how much of God's character is present within me or within you. That's how that progression moves along. And there's this really interesting image that's, that's kind of buried in there in that word establish that I thought was worth sharing this week. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll start with a, just a, a short story and give you that image. And that is, you know, with all that's been going on in, in Israel and, and the territories around, um, I was there 23 years ago and studying the conflict and all that, and of course it's changed a lot since then. One of the remarkable things that... that uh, I still remember that I got to do is I got to go plant olive trees for a couple hours one day in the northern part of the West Bank, trying to make the land usable. That's what one of these groups was trying to do. And as we were out planting olive trees in this rather desolate area, um, at the end of that, we needed to water them. And so, you know, this is kind of rocky, scrub brush area. And all of a sudden, the, the guide that brought us there takes this big rock, just lifts it up, and moves it over, and there's this hole in the ground with a well. You read about wells in the Old Testament and, and what it was like, and it's just a hole in the ground. It just goes down. There's a bucket on a string. Pull it up, water the plants. But what's remarkable in the imagery that's here is when he took the stone and put it back on, it just fit beautifully in this little space created for the stone. That word establish is actually that sort of image of the stone rolled onto, perfectly fitting into the cover. So the concept is trust. That stone's not going anywhere because it fully has committed to where it's placed. And that's what's going on here. The, the commitment and the establish. God's going to establish a plan. When he does that, we can trust him fully and completely in the right place. I thought it was a beautiful image. If we're going to truly live out the meaning of this passage, And I talked about, you know, asking God to baptize our plans versus desiring a transformed heart. May I suggest a simple prayer that you can take with you this week. Instead of praying in a way that asks God to baptize our plans and decisions, let me just give you this this commission. Lord Jesus, transform my heart. I think that's the start of the whole thing. Lord Jesus, transform my heart. That makes the most sense of commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans because then you are weighing it out by what the Lord wants. Transform my heart. Let's pray accordingly right now. Lord Jesus, do transform our hearts. Some of us know your son Jesus and follow him. Uh, But there are times when you call us to do things that do seem uncomfortable, that seem to, to pull us away from what we think is right, but you're calling us to something better. And when you do that, Lord, establish the plans. Make it so we are firm and steadfast in our trust in you as we follow through. For those of us that haven't yet experienced salvation through your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, today, uh, would you draw us by your spirit into his presence that we could say yes to him. Lord, wherever we find ourselves in proximity to you, may today be a day of transformation so that we come closer and closer 
never further away. So that when we hear the call to become more like your son, Jesus Christ, we're drawn in, whatever the cost. We pray this all in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. You were the word at the beginning. One with God, the Lord most high. these words from Jude as our benediction today to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages forevermore. Amen. Go in peace.